Hello, um, uh, my name is David Butler and I'm the head of charities and not-for-profits at Bishop Fleming and I'd like to welcome you to the latest in our series of cha charity webinars. When I introduced the last webinar, I speculated it might have been the last one we did before going back <coughs> to in-person seminars. Well, I guess here we are again, um, a combination of over-optimism on my part and also a realisation that webinars actually aren't all that bad and everyone seems to, seems to quite like them. Um, we'd assume that people would want to get back to face-to-face -face meetings and seminars as soon as they could, but this hasn't been the case. And in fact, actually we have a record number of people signing up to this webinar. So I think, yeah, this may be the shape of things um, for, for some time to come. So, I mean, it certainly seems to us that many of the changes that have been caused by COVID are going to be here to stay and there's a need for us all to adapt. And the charity sector is no different. I mean, things are an awful lot better than they were a couple of years ago. For example, I mean, you can't tell because I've got a backdrop, but I am in a real life office. Um, but not everything is as it once was. Um, this means charities need to adapt their, their way of thinking and their strategies, learn from the past, but also consider new possibilities. And ultimately, that's that's what this webinar is all about. So we've a fairly packed agenda for the next 40 minutes or so. I'll only take up a few minutes of your time to go over the housekeeping and then provide a brief update on the sector. And then we have two other speakers. So we have Sally Timmons, who's a member of our charity team and is also a national leader of governance. And we have Alistair Campbell, who heads up our risk assurance and internal audit team. So Sally and Alistair will be going through some recent examples of charity governance failures. Um, Sally will be highlighting the issues and the lessons learned and Alistair um, using his clever 2020 hindsight will then be considering how these issues could have been preempted by the board if they had the right level of information and assurance. And as always with these things, at the end of the session there will be a Q&A. So please submit any questions you have using the Q&A option, which hopefully you can find um, on your screen. And we will do our best to answer all the questions, but if we don't get around to yours, then we'll answer it after the event. And and so there'll be a recording of this event. We'll send out the Q&A answers plus um, a link to some other useful resources. So <clears throat> there are now some, some genuine reasons to be hopeful about the future as the last of the COVID restrictions are being removed. Offices are getting busier, pubs and restaurants are filling up and footfall on the high streets is increasing. However, it would be fair to say there are one or two headwinds that will directly impact on the charity sector. Surging inflation, Energy prices, staffing shortages are three of the big ones, but by no means are these the only issues. So, I mean, the war in Ukraine has shocked the world and focused the minds of the charity sector. And you know, we probably look, none of us watched the recent concert for Ukraine. That's a sort of prime example of how the sectors come together. Um, and appeals of this nature always generate new donations, but there is a risk that some of this fundraising will be at the expense of other charities. The inflationary pressures and the rising energy costs mean that we all face higher costs. But can the charity sector generate additional income to cover these costs? Um, and, and there are two major problems with that. So the first is, you know, is the way income is made up. So the largest component of charity funding typically comes from donations and sales at just over 40%. The last couple of years of COVID have had an impact on that, but the long term it's for, just over 40% comes from, um, from donations and sales. The next largest component comes from central and local government, and that's not, normally not far behind, it's high 30%. And both of these income streams are under pressure. So a number of commentators stated that with tax rises and higher costs, the squeeze on disposable income will be severe and this will impact on, on charitable giving. Pro bono economics says that charity income tends to track household income relatively closely over time. So as household income falls, then there could be a hit to donations, subscriptions and revenue. Um, and data from the Office of Budgetary Responsibility implies that this squeeze could result in a 3% drop in charity income in 2022. What happens beyond that, it's hard to say, but certainly, you know, we know um, <clears throat> the data seems to be saying 2022 is going to be a fairly tough year for charities. Um, government funding is also under pressure after two years of record borrowing, which means that um, <clears throat> government's going to have to make decisions about what they consider to be essential spend. And so some charities inevitably will lose out. Furthermore, with inflation expected to peak at around 10%, it seems highly unlikely to put it mildly that government funding is going to increase at that same rate. So if your charity is funded by public money, then costs will be rising more than income. And given the muted response of the sector to the spring statement, it doesn't appear to be much additional support available. So in summary there, charities are facing higher costs with no real prospects of those costs being covered by higher income from donations or government funding in the short term. So charities will need to think differently as to how to plug that gap or how they can provide their services in a different way. And continuing this sort of less than optimistic theme, then we also need to do that with less staff. So recruitment of staff shortages have become a major issue for, for many charities and, it, and it's not just charities. I mean, it's you, know, you just have to look at the news today and, and EasyJet and, and BA don't have the staff to, to, run, to run their flights. So this is a major issue for the whole economy. But 
certainly with charities, they're going to need to look at ways to improve efficiency and generate additional income to help balance the books. And at the same point, consider those staffing constraints. One of the few positives coming out of the pandemic was that funding was made available to support charities, and this has given them stronger balance sheets and more reserves than they had two years ago. And certainly that's been the experience of the majority of the charities that I work with. Consequently, they're better, better place to deal with the cost pressures than they would have been. However, cash flow is now getting far greater focus than it did before. And uh, certainly and as, the, as the support funding is withdrawn and charities um, start to restart, restart their service provisions. So I mean, for all organisations, whether you're charitable or not, starting or restarting a service or increasing supply almost always has a negative impact on cash flow. So budgeting and forecast may need to be revisited. So I appreciate that's, that's a few minutes of a fair sort of negativity. So, so the one bit of positive news which may help some charities fill that funding gap is that there's an expectation there will be a sharp rise in the value of legacies, the total bequests being 25% higher over the next five years than the last five years. And this is largely driven by two things. One is property values, which have continued to increase significantly, but also there's a, there's a significant backlog in probate claims. And as, that, um, as they start to catch up, that is going to give a boost in the current year. And we've already seen in January and February, um, legacies were 12 and a half percent up the, the way they were last year. So for some charities, and I appreciate it's not all charities, but for some charities that will provide a welcome boost. Um, before I hand over to Sally, the last thing I wanted to mention was the Charities Act 2022. And I'm sure you'll be hearing um, lots from solicitors over the com coming months on this. Um, and it is it's generally pretty good news. So I just thought I'd give you the headlines and if nothing else, that will raise a few questions in your mind that you can talk to your solicitors about. So the main changes coming through are as follows. So the first one is it's going to be easier to change your governing documents and royal charters, and that will make it give charities a bit more flexibility or reduce the costs of change. So yeah, a good thing there. There's also some relaxation on the on the um, on the sale of land. Um, one of the major changes is, is is you're going to have more flexibility on the use of permanent endowments, um, and actually it's now going to be possible for most charities to borrow so essentially borrow 25% of any permanent endowment. Um, as long as it's got you know, subject to a 20 year recruitment period. So you know, that gives a lot of charities flexibility and, and access to a bit of funding that would previously be tied up. There's more flexibility around ex gratia payments of up to £20,000. So again, you're know, just simplifying some of the rules. Um, trustees can now be paid for goods and not just services, which just seems like sort of common sense. But you know, obviously this is the only way it's in the best interest of the charity, which by and large means cheaper. Um, and also there are simpler and more proportionate rules on failed fundraising appeals. There are a few other things, but all in all, it is pretty good news. Anyway, um, I think you've probably heard enough from me, so I'm now going to hand over to, to Sally and Alistair, who will be talking about some of the recent um, governance failings and the lessons that can be learned. Thanks, David. Yeah, it's quite, a, quite an ask, isn't it? Being a charity trustee um, at the moment and over the last two years in particularly, but it's not been an easy role ever, really. Um, it's a big ask. We are unpaid volunteers who've got huge responsibilities to comply with a raft of uh, legal and regulatory requirements. The companies act as directors, the charity commission and of course the law. <clears throat> we all want to do the right thing, um, but you may not have done the role before. So understanding what that trustee's role really is within the charity is so important. Um, and of course, understanding what assurance you need to have in place to make sure that you're doing the right thing um, and of course, we're doing it for the right reasons. And I'd like to think that most are doing it for the right reasons. Um, but of course, it's not until something goes wrong that you question um, what some motives were and, and actually whether the, the decision to be there was the right one. The larger the organisation, the greater the reliance upon the delegations to paid executives, of course. Um, and what that means is that the framework that you need to effectively have oversight um, as trustees has got to be really strong, robust and work really, really well. And of course, the skills and capacity of the, the trustees and the governance practices of the charity could have gone unchecked for some time. If you're joining a board new, you don't know what that situation has been recently um, or, or historically even. Um, and paid executives, particularly over COVID, could have been left largely to get on with it. Um, and that's where the risks can lie and problems can occur. 
So how do we know that the executives are all doing the right things and all that we need them to do and all that we want them to do to run the charity effectively and in the interest of the beneficiaries, of course, um, which has to be at the forefront of our minds and all the decisions that we make. And are the frameworks that we think that that are there, are they actually living in practice? So understanding what that strategic role is as a trustee, <coughs> excuse me, um, is, is really important um, and we have to keep our activity in the right lines and within the boundaries of our charitable ob objects in practice and of course that's really really important um, and the framework that you have within the governance arrangements must make sure that all that is is boundaried takes place um, and and doesn't blur any lines and as I say if if that doesn't happen then there can be some pretty serious outcomes in the charity world, of course, reputation is everything. Uh, we need to be so careful um, that we don't fall into the trap of being complacent and that processes get trimmed or cut down or even missed completely. As David said, legacies are a massive part of the income in most cases or a lot of cases a significant um, and, and potentially the only source of income generally. So um, it's hugely important to make sure that that reputation is, is right up there and maintained. Scale of your charity does obviously play a part, um, but, but whether the charity is big or small, as the Charity Commission has said, no charity is so large nor its mission so important that it can afford to put its own reputation ahead of the dignity and well-being of those it exists to protect. And no charity is equally too small to bear its own share of responsibility for upholding the wider good name of the charity. So as I say, reputation, everything, you've got to maintain that and therefore scandal, anything like that is something we really don't want to risk occurring at any point in time. <clears throat> So let's take a look at a couple of high level, uh, a high level look at a couple of examples of when it goes wrong and we'll start to see some common themes that, that, that are coming out of it. Of course, as David said and Alistair will come on to, it is wonderful to have the benefit of hindsight, um, but actually let's see what we can learn from them. So if I start with a, a high profile one that you will have you will have heard about, um, um, no doubt, and that's the allegations of cash for honours um, and a scandal involving the Prince's Foundation. And that's where there were reports of middlemen who took cuts for setting up dinners involving wealthy donors and Prince Charles. And Clarence House responded that Prince Charles had no knowledge of the allegation, uh, oops, uh, sorry, of the alleged offer of honours or British citizenship on the basis of donations and fully supports the investigation. Well, of course, you would expect that. So the charity hired auditors Ernst Young, um, who were uh, carrying out the investigation, and they published uh, a summary report in December 21, stating that the chief executive had coordinated with fixers, um, but, but there was no evidence that the trustees at the time were aware of these communications, and he subsequently resigned. But then the chair of the trustees, Dame Sue Bruce, issued a statement that included the words, trustees of the Prince's Foundation have launched a robust and detailed governance review in line with the Charity Governance Code, which will consider the principles and recommended practices. So it just goes to show, it doesn't matter how, um, how high profile your, um, your sponsors or, or connected individuals, there is no, no organisation that is immune for the need for robust governance and even the foundation has acknowledged that they need to do a full and detailed review. So if we look um, at a bit more historical one now, but again, I include this purely and simply because it shows again that no organisation is immune, <coughs> excuse me, and that's Oxfam. Um, and of course, in 2019, the Charity Commission published um, the final conclusion of, of investigations, which were really complex and, and huge, significant scale. Um, you'll no doubt recall this was a, a safeguarding situation. But in summary, um, the Charity Commission found that policies were not consistently applied, uh, concerns were not escalated through the charity and they were not followed up 
that's crucial. Um, external report outcomes, again, not followed up with remedial action and openness and honesty was, was deemed to be severely lacking. Another one much more recent, um, not perhaps as, as well known, but animal protection services. Um, and the Charity Commission announced it was opening uh, a statutory inquiry into the animal protection services, um, following significant concerns <clears throat> about private prosecutions that the charity brought against pet owners. Um, so what they're going to be looking at is the decision making around the private prosecutions, which was which was part of the of the charity's objects. Um, and whether the, the trustees had avoided or adequately managed conflicts of interest, um, was there any unauthorised direct or indirect private benefit, and the trustees' failure to comply with the legal obligations and some pretty basic stuff, which was even just filing um, charity accounts and annual returns. Um, in this particular case, interestingly, the trustees are not named, not named and shamed, um, as they have a dispensation um, which can be can be applied for and granted by the Commission where putting trustees legal names in the public domain could actually put someone in danger. And I thought I'd look at um, a local one to the southwest, Humanity Tour Bay. Um, again, wanted to show this one because it's another angle. So this one is about social media posts. Again, very, very recent March, um, just a couple of weeks ago. Um, and the, the, the trustees were warned that political views were, were not a good idea as trustees should uh, ensure that when senior staff speak publicly on behalf of the charity, again reputational, um, those statements must further the charity's objects and not their own political views. And despite giving assurance, um, the trustees were not able to stop um, posts being put on Facebook used by the charity. And the charity, which was incorporated in October 2017, was removed from the register in March 21. And my last example um, is the Capricorn Animal Rescue and Sanctuary. Um, financial governance failings here were um, improper financial control. So as you can see by my examples, I've put, picked different, uh, different issues, but actually there is a core theme running through this. Um, there was no proper financial control, even cash boxes, collections um, hadn't been adequately recorded. Um, leases that were entered into were not in the charity's best interests and trustees allowed arrears of rent and, and charges to accrue. Um, bequeathed property, think about what David was talking about earlier, the property was not managed and maintained appropriately and animal welfare issues were so great that the RSPCA was involved. Again, failure to deal with concerns raised, failure to respond to recommendations for change um, and there was also a benefit to a trustee who lived at the site under favourable uh, terms. So the common themes around these cases are that the trustees did not have the frameworks in place to be able to know that the key element of governance were actually happening. And that's from the basics right up for, you know, cash, cash collection boxes not being administered properly um, right up to um, the objects and the, um, you know, the, the overarching principles of the of the charity not not happening in the right way. So um, there's a the control frameworks weren't there. Um, the policies potentially lying on a virtual shelf. Um, controls were they living in practice? No. Were they improving things? No. And that's from the charity vision, as I say, all the way through. So the absolutes of financial processes and procedures haven't been met, but also angles of non-financial control processes, and the board were blissfully unaware in pretty much each case. And as a trustee. It's not our role to undertake operational tasks and running of charities day to day. It's to make sure that those who are paid to do so act appropriately and follow the legislation, law and obligations of the status of charities within the interests of the beneficiaries. First and foremost, we need to keep in mind the guidance and aim for that gold model and apply the principles of public life. And the charity governance code it really is the gold model. Um, it has the seven pillars of uh, principles. 
it's a deliberately aspirational document and something for charities to aim for. As you may know, it is a voluntary code, but actually if you want to do the process right and you want to have the governance as, as strong and robust as it can be, I can't see why it wouldn't be adopted. And actually, um, it, it looks like most charities do adopt the code these days. It was in, it was refreshed uh, recently to enhance uh, and embed behaviour rather than just statements um, in actual practice on day to day governance. And if we look at that exemplar of effective governance, um, the, the, the pillars of organisational purpose, leadership, integrity, decision making, risk and control, board effectiveness, equality, diversity and inclusion and openness and accountability. When you look at those seven, um, you can see from the case studies that we've pulled out to talk to you about today that they just weren't being applied. The failings from our examples can fall into probably all of these categories, but actually most focus on decision making, risk and control, and actually the board being effective, openness and accountability. So as trustees, we do need to make sure that we have these frameworks and systems and that will not only protect the charity, but us as well. And good decision making comes from a variety of views, variety of really, really strong, good conversation and challenge, uh, quality information to be able to make those decisions. And of course, evidencing in the minutes to show the rationale for whatever decision it was that the board has made. So what evidence can we bring to show that decisions have been made right, accurate and timely? What are we recording in our minutes? Have we looked at the risks that we face as an organisation and what can we do to mitigate them? Alistair will come on to talk about these shortly. And how do we know that everybody charged with governance and that's the trustees and the paid executive have been truly open, transparent and selfless? And in these cases, it was very much lacking. So what do we need to do? We need to evaluate our own practice, look at the people around the table, look at the trustees and make certain that they are equipped to understand what is asked of them and fulfill that role. And the Nolan principles, <coughs> excuse me, the Nolan principles are um, the, the principles of public life as we know them. And in actual fact, um, when you come back to the core principles of um, public life, you, you can't go far wrong. So you can see from what we've looked at so far, integrity and accountability, honesty and leadership have not been as strong as they should have been. When we help trustees to look at evaluating practice, if there is a problem or even if there isn't, um, it usually comes down to understanding and staying true to the Nolan principles in some way. And when we evaluate our practice, it's really important to have a fresh look, to have some, some uh, additional viewpoints. And of course, um, evaluating that can be in a variety of forms that can be done as a self-evaluation a self practice um, and to look at third party help as well. The charity governance is really, really um, an exemplar, as I said, and if you can hold true to those principles, you're not going to go far wrong. The Charity Commission recommend an external review every three years, and that's, of course, on top of your own self evaluation. And with fresh eyes and perspectives, we can really take advantage of of looking at best practice and seeing how we can make our governance so much more effective. And that leads me quite nicely on to what Alistair has to say about assurance and what we can do to use assurance to really help the board make the right decisions. Thanks, Sunny. Some really interesting points there and fairly important messages. I think everyone will agree. Um, I'll just spend a few minutes drawing on some of uh, the points made, drawing it together and perhaps discussing some of the questions that trustees should be asking routinely to make sure that you're as informed as you can be um, and try and stop some of those situations um, happening. And as David said, although it may sound a bit like 2020 hindsight, uh, we are auditors after all. Um, for me, one of the key ways that some of the issues that Sally described could have been avoided 
is if there uh, perhaps had been more focus on challenge, um, challenging whether everything was OK, considering things that would cause the charity a problem, and therefore whether we are in a position to head these off before they actually do become problems. In technical terms, having clarity over risks and assurances, two key aspects. For me, um, those who've seen sessions on, on risk management for me before, I always come back to two key questions. Senior officers and trustees alike need to be able to answer both of these questions. Number one, do I know the risks facing my charity or what's going to stop or hinder us doing what we want to do or need to do? But importantly, and number two, how or where am I assured that these risks are properly and effectively dealt with? You nearly need both questions to be answered to get a full picture on, on everything. I do use the word assured in that second question very deliberately. Assurance here is just another word for evidence or proof or confirmation or even comfort. It's what allows you to sleep peacefully at night, reassured that you know positively that everything that could cause you a problem is being dealt with. So assurance is a key part of overall risk management. There is no point in spotting risks or boulders in, in your path if you've got no way of considering whether you're able to sidestep them. The answer to that important second question comes from asking or challenging, how do we really know? And Sally used the question as well. How do we really know? That's, that's, that's the key assurance theme. How do we really know we've identified all the key risks that could cause us a problem? How do we really know that what we're saying we do to address them is actually effective, i.e. is it properly understood by staff and actually happening in practice? And how do we really know that any follow up actions are um, uh, identified as a result of any questions or gaps have actually been taken? And also whether they've made any difference. How do we know? So assurance is not the same thing as simply putting controls in place and quite often the two do get mixed up. Controls are what you do to stop a risk happening. Assurance, in turn, is what tells you that it's been that this has been um, uh, uh, effective. So take an, take an example. Data loss from the all too common situation of IT systems going down or laptops crashing. Um, something we've all experienced to some degree, I'm sure, either at work or home. And um, I spoke to my son last night who's got a college assignment due this week, um, and I suggested backing up the laptop would be a or at least the document he's working on would be a very sensible thing to be doing. So, so a standard control process to mitigate that risk of data loss is to take a regular backup. That seems common sense. So uh, yeah, it's fine. I've backed up. But the assurance bit comes from asking, well, actually, how often have we been backing up? Or how often should we back up? Do we actually back up as often as we think we do? And crucially, how often do we restore or test those backups so we actually know, can prove to ourselves that we can get back the data in the way that we think we can? In other words, answering our how do I know question, how do I know that I really could recover all my data from a recent backup? So assurance can come from a variety of sources and in many cases actually is already present. Um, it just needs to be recognised and actually made use of. So the first point, management and other um, uh, internal sources are really that first point, that first step for, for assurance. You have regular management information, KPIs, etc. all provide evidence that you're doing what, what the charity needs to be doing, but you also have management there to ask questions of, which is an important second layer of assurance. So trustees, boards and committees can add this second layer of assurance through a sort of one step um, um, stand back challenge. You asking how do we know or actually asking management how do you as management know those questions um, and, and, and um, sort of various challenges and then properly considering the well so what or what does that actually then mean for us or for our charity? What do we therefore need to do as a result points? That's an important second layer of assurance and that's those are complemented by a third layer so assurance coming from external sources. Auditors, both external and internal audit, other consultants, specialists, and even more formal inspections all provide us with extra pieces of that jigsaw that allows the trustees to build up that overall picture of how well everything is working or not, and whether you've considered what's coming over the hill and whether you're ready for it. So whilst as a charity, um, in general, unlike other some, sec some other sectors, you aren't actually required to have formal internal audits to provide that third line 
of um, assurance. But there is scope for some form of internal audit help to add to what you have in place already. In many respects, actually not having a mandated requirement to have internal audit gives you a bit more freedom, it gives you the freedom to ask auditors to look at specific things only or perhaps give advice on a particular topic. So whether you do or you don't have currently some form of, of internal audit, what you do need assurances from somewhere. So you need to have that how do I know question answered. So you need to be clear where those answers are going to come from, uh, whether they actually are telling you what you need, and also it helps you answer or, or tells you where your next steps or questions um, need, need to come from. Most organisations um, tend to draw the answers to that, those two questions, the risk and assurances together on some form of risk register or equivalent document. Um, as well as serving as a handy reminder for management meetings, yes, they should be used at management meetings as well, not just board, um, that you're considering everything that, that you need to that's um, um, a challenge and a priority. They also serve to summarise and therefore prompt committee discussion um, and certainly at, at, at boards to make sure that you are looking at the right areas. You're probably discussing those high priority areas anyway, being a board meeting. So the risk register, if it's used properly, should just be a bit of an aid memoir and a prompt. So do try to keep the risk registers as simple as possible. I know that sounds slightly counter uh, intuitive, but kept simple as possible, therefore remaining a practical help rather than the all too often deferred administrative burden that they quite often become. So in general, most organisations do fill out the sort of left hand side of the traditional risk register well. So the answer to the first question, what are our risks? But generally, most organisations um, across all sectors um, could do with a bit more focus on the usually less fully completed right hand side of the register, which is the answer to the second question. Where are my assurances and what are they telling me? What do I now need to do next? This can be as simple, um, the answer to, to, to that sort of right hand side could be as simple as, well, uh, the last audit that we had in this area was three weeks ago and it confirmed that everything was working as expected. Um, that's slightly different to if you'd put the last audit was three weeks ago, but found that no one was doing what they should be doing, so we're highly exposed. Or the last audit was actually three years ago, it was all fine at the time. The point is that actually asking and answering that second question, how do we know, where's our assurance, gives you entirely different actions based on the answer. So in those cases, firstly, either monitor that the good work continues to happen, fix the non-compliant work and get the people doing what they should be doing in the second example, or third example, go out and get some more up-to-date assurance, rerun an audit or get some other form. So this is how trustees and committees should use assurance to provide greater certainty over performance and operations and ultimately therefore risks. You must ask questions, as Sally said, you must request information to fill in at any gaps. You must ask management how they know everything is working as expected and importantly, consider what else is left. Ask about information you haven't been provided with as well as information that, that, that you have. Look for alternative, perhaps sometimes um, unpalatable explanations for things. Ask for information to positively exclude those, those things happening. Hold management to account in terms of delivery of key information and related actions. Other themes picking up from Sally's case studies, make sure that you challenge warning signs. Make sure that you have mechanisms that would provide you as trustees with sight of any concerns raised by third parties and equally be clear on how those may impact the charity's goals and operations. The board is ultimately responsible for the management of risks facing the charity, as each trustee individually is also responsible. So asking for and getting that information to help you fully answer and discharge um, that responsibility is paramount. So as a final note, um, this is a bit of um, advice to help lift assurance off the paper. Many audit or equivalent um, committees across the public and private sectors supplement ordinary risk management discussions by actually bringing a manager from different areas of the of, of, of the organisation or service to each meeting, perhaps just for a 10 to 15 minute deep dive on a particular subject or risk theme. What this enables the committee to do is ask questions, but also have a proper conversation rather than just receiving a passive assurance paper, which are important, but having a conversation with a manager actually allows more for a two-way dialogue. It aids the understanding of the, of the committee or the board, but it also, if it's done in the right way, 
the manager also gains a better understanding of the committee's or board's view on risk and also what, what they need to be assured on. So it's something you might be able to try at a committee or even board perhaps just to try and add to that assurance jigsaw. So in summary, risks can and do take several forms um, from those that are constantly with us to those that can quickly emerge and grow. Having proper visibility over the risks, but as importantly, what you are able to currently do about them and what else you need to do is a critical step in your defence. And on that note, I'll hand back to David to wrap up and go into any questions that we've that we've had. Thank you very much. Thanks, Alistair. Uh, thanks, Sally. That was uh, that was really interesting. And certainly you know, from my perspective as an auditor, I mean, there's, there's a lot in there for, for me to, to take on board. Um, and yeah, clearly we've had a few, few questions coming through, so other people have had similar thoughts to me. So if I just quickly go through some of those questions. So, that, so the first one, which I think is one for Sally, um, is, is talking about evaluation, evaluating board effectiveness. So it's, a, so it's where do we start to evaluate our own effectiveness as we've never done that before? So I guess, Sally, is there any tips as to, as to how you go about that process? Thanks, David. Uh, yeah, it's it's um, it's an annual exercise, as I said in my in my presentation. It's it's an annual exercise you really ought to do. Um, you can start by um, going back to the charity governance code. There is actually a link at the end of it that takes you to a, a template, which is a really good place to start. And it goes through the uh, the different sections of the code and what good practice might look like. And, and therefore you can you can evaluate your own knowledge, um, uh, the board's knowledge at that at that point and basically build an action plan to try and upskill and do some training or undertake some um, some um, you know additional resources or whatever um, but but that's a really good place to start um, and of course having an external view is a really really good idea um, as I said it before the charity commission recommend it every three years um, and it, it really does help to have some fresh views some fresh eyes and of course then you can hear um, and collaborate on best practice so that's where I would start. OK, um, thanks, Sally. And probably follow on from that, which you sort of touched on. So the question came in was, um, are there any templates available for reviewing trustees knowledge and, and expertise and experience? There are, yes. Um, it, actually, the guidance that the Charity Commission gives is really, really helpful. Um, and also on um, the government websites, gov.uk, there are some really good templates that, that come out. Um, if you follow uh, if you follow a risk um, a risk question, um, it takes you to templates on on risk management. And similarly, in connection with the skills audit, there is one at Reach Volunteering, which is um, quite a simplistic, uh, useful document, which is um, for for smaller charities, but but actually can apply at any scale. And it's got some really good notes on on how to use that as a as a tool to to evaluate your practice. Um, thanks, Sally. Uh, the next one is is for Alistair. Um, so the question was, we don't currently have an internal audit because it's not something they're required to do, which I guess something you touched on. Um, but th we are thinking about it, though. What form should that take? Which I guess is a fairly open question, which hopefully you can <coughs> enlighten yeah, us with. It's a nice open question. It's a nice open answer, actually. And and you in the charity sector, you've 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 got quite an extensive freedom, as I touched on when I was speaking. Um, Compared to some other sectors, public across the, the public and the not and the not for profit and indeed private sector, where to to some or more degree, generally internal audit is is mandated. You have to have it, and actually in many cases, there's there's a sort of shopping list of things that that you have to cover. Um, the Charity Commission does have some guidance on on um, sort of general um, assurance and financial controls, etc. But from an audit point of view, you've got the freedom to say actually answering those two key questions, where are my risks and, and where are my assurances? You can use internal audit as you see fit um, to lesser or, or more extent to help you answer those questions. And that can be starting with just a quick whistle stop tour of your financial controls just to give assurance that actually everything is working, but also finance staff are protected as well, which is a key part of internal audit. Is is there too much responsibility, too much cited in sort of one individual um, segregation of duties, which appreciate is difficult for smaller organisations, but we can advise on that. But we can advise on so much more. So Sally was talking about governance and effectiveness reviews. We can internal audit can come and 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 help um, look at reporting lines, management, board effectiveness, challenge, scrutiny, um, a whole host of things, as well as sort of more core financial um, operations, 
fundraising, um, communications, and even things like employee mental health and well-being. So you, you've got the luxury of having a look at your risk register, which I would say is the starting point, and internal audit can help you identify and work with you to help those two, two key questions as well. Help evolve a risk register or indeed make it practical, but also help find out or work with you to work out where those assurances are to then work out what other assurances and, and support we can give you. Thanks, Alistair. And, and a follow up question to that, which I have to admit made me smile when it came in as, as with my experience as a trustee. I, I, this is it's cropped up in a number of meetings. So it's, do we really need to have a risk register? That's a good question. And it is a good question because actually there's this school of thought that says, well, either I don't want one because it's it's just too much of a burden or actually I know I've got to have one, but I, I have one, but I don't I don't use it. And, and I think the theme coming out of, 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 of my little um, speech was um, I think what you need to do is have something that answers those questions. So you need something that says actually what's going to stop us? What keeps us awake at night? What is going to get in our way? What are we worried about? What are we probably already spending most of each day and board meeting talking about? So start off with just a list of risks, lists of problems or hurdles and equally then think, well, are we able to do enough about these as we think? What else would we want to do? Have we got capacity and capability, funding, personnel, time to do what we need to do about those risks? And therefore, which of these risks could cause us a problem but we're probably all right with and which actually therefore are the ones left which we need to spend more time focusing on and doing something more about? If your risk register does that and nothing more, then you have taken a great stride forward in actually getting that great sort of visibility over risk and risk management. Keep it simple, make it a bit of an aid memoir, prompt board's discussion, don't have a risk register with 383 risks and an A3 sheet that falls off the, the edge of the printer because no one's going to read it and, it and it won't help you. So start small, start with that risk of list, uh, list of risks and then just think, what else do we need to do? Thanks, Alistair. Um, we, we have one last question, um, unless anybody else submits any in the next few minutes, which is is a, a tax based question. So we have one of my colleagues been waiting in the wings. So John Sparks, um, who's a uh, tax director and, and leads our, our charity tax team. Um, so I guess this one seems to be geared up to you, John. So, so to what extent should we consider tax as a risk? Thanks, David. Um, yeah, I think the, the bottom line is with charities and not-for-profit organisations, tax can be very often be one of those things that's taken for granted. Um, lots of nice exemptions available um, for charitable activities, and of course that is fantastic and very helpful. Um, and equally, lots of lots of benefits in terms of things like gift aid and um, business rate relief and all of those sorts of things that the sector value very highly. Um, of course, that's not to say that there aren't tax risks associated with with operations. Um, gift aid is is very very technical in terms of the rules that apply in 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 um, ensuring that you're compliant with the rules. Um, non primary purpose trading is uh, is obviously a significant area in the use of trading subsidiaries, um, and then you've got the other com taxes such as VAT and payroll, which are also increasingly complex and, and particularly with employment taxes, areas like IR35 and employment status have been a hot topic in, in practice in for 20 years, uh, as long as I've been been in, in, in the industry and, and they will continue to be so. And they apply to charities and not-for-profits equally as they do to co corporate and commercial businesses. Um, so I think tax, it's certainly appropriate to consider tax as a risk. Um, certainly for those of you that have got trading subsidiaries, um, we've seen lots of trading subsidiaries during the pandemic um, that have been loss making um, and, you know, needs to question and consider whether it's appropriate to be making those investments. Those sorts of things have a regulatory and charity law implication, but they have a tax implication as well. So it's very, very appropriate to be considering tax as a, as a key risk. Great. Thanks, John. Um, so to that brings this webinar to a close. So, so thank you everyone for, for joining us today, which I, and I hope you found it all, all very interesting. I certainly did as an observer. Um, 
so, so we will be sending out um, links to this uh, webinar and there'll be a recording of it, um, but also just to highlight. So on the Bishop Flowing website, we have a, a charity page and we also have a knowledge hub. So, so there's, there's plenty of, if you've, if you've enjoyed what you've heard today, there's, there's plenty more information and recordings of previous webinars that we've done. Um, so, so that's a good destination for you all. And so, yeah, once again, just you know, thank you for joining us. Thank you to, to John, Alistair and Sally for your, um, for your presentations and I look forward to seeing you all next time.